Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table, video casts on relevant issues related to culture and theology. And today, our topic is sexuality, particularly homosexuality. And I have two outstanding guests with me today. Uh, Dr. Stan Jones is provost and professor of psychology at Wheaton College and is an expert in this area, having written in the area and having uh, looked at the research that's, uh, that touches on the subject of homosexuality. And Dr. Michael Brown, who is uh, president of the Fire School of Ministry, an undergraduate school in Concord, North Carolina. He also is an adjunct professor at Gordon-Conwell and Southern and Denver and King Seminary. He just travels around the country teaching everywhere. <laughs> and uh, uh, he's also syndicated, uh, has a syndicated radio program on the Salem Radio Network entitled The Line of Fire. Uh, good day, gentlemen. We're pleased to have you with us. Thanks for having us, Daryl. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, I'm going to just uh, launch right in. Uh, this is an important topic. Uh, the issue of homosexuality is certainly one that resonates through our culture in a variety of ways and a variety of levels. It's in the media. It's in the news. Uh, it, yeah, we're dealing with uh, legal issues that are related to it. Uh, there have been uh, all kinds of studies psychologically about what goes on in this area. But I'd like to start with this question, and it is, why is the discussion of homosexuality an important conversation to have uh, in relationship to discussing sexuality in general? And Stan, I'll let you lead us in. Well, I think there are a number of reasons, Daryl, and, and one that comes to mind is that oftentimes we get quite uh, polarized, push, pushing the the discussion in a direction that it's a, it's about them out there, when in reality homosexuality is just one variety of sexual brokenness, of sexual trouble, uh, the troubled nature of the, of our of the sexual nature of the entire human race. And I think that contextualizing the conversation about homosexuality in a broader understanding about sexuality helps to build bridges, helps us to approach the conversation with humility. And I think that's, those are crucial characteristics to having an effective ministry. I think another reason why it's it's really, really crucial is that um, increasingly the, the conversation is framed in the matter of civil rights. We're just coming through a very political season, and that's exactly what we're hearing this these days. And uh, I think understanding the sexuality in the context, homosexuality in the context of sexuality helps us to frame the issue the way Scripture itself frames the issue. Sexuality is a gift, but it's a gift that all of us experience in broken form, in need of being redeemed. And uh, think of the teaching in, uh, in Second Timothy about uh, every gift from God is uh, is to be received with gratitude if it is uh, sanctified, and uh, and that's a really crucial teaching. And so, by examining homosexuality in the context of the broader issues, it helps to anchor us in a way that uh, gives us access to fruitful conversations about the topic. Okay, um, uh, Michael, you have anything to to add in thinking through why sexuality and homosexuality should be uh, kept on the table together? Just in, in brief, because the main exposure we have to this is the day and night bombardment of gay activism and the day and night bombardment through the media, it's important that we not lose the larger context and that we not lose our heart of those that we're reaching out to. Simply that. Uh, you know, to me, it seems like that the whole issue of the way God has designed the creation and the relationship between male and female, as well as the relationship between people in general, is an important part of this conversation. And and that sometimes in the discussion of homosexuality, we lose the picture of what it is to be to be a human being and to be made in the image of God. Um, does that impact this discussion in, in your own thinking at all? It does. I think that uh, that the concept of being made in the image of God really does include our physicality. Include it includes our gender, our sexuality, and uh, this is a this is a, a tremendous gift from God. It's a way that we reflect the diversity and the unity of the human being. There's a sense in which the unity that can be achieved between a man and a woman in marriage is somehow reflective of the complexity of God's relationship within the Godhead, and so these issues uh, are really uh, really really crucial to tie together. 
and it makes for a uniqueness in in the male female relationship in showing that diversity as well. It does, and in the current conversation, there's oftentimes a rejection of any any kind of norms to gather to to govern behavior, and there's this this idea that the the primary thing is to free ourselves to uh, to shake shake off the shackles of expectations and norms and demands. And I think this is a really primary thing that the Christian message teaches us, that our sexuality is a gift, but it's a broken gift that we have to offer back to God to be redeemed and shaped. And so the the trajectory of the human person is becoming more and more what God intended you to be. You're being called to something other than what you are now. And in so much of the sexuality dialogues in the church, the way it's framed is quite contrary to that, that that the way to access your true humanness is to find out what you really are and embrace what's inside, Mm -hmm. as, as if you're your impulses and desires define you. And I think that's one of the most crucial and deep issues that Christians have to resist. It's not our, our desires and inclinations inside are real, but those are things that we offer up to God for Him to call us towards what He would have us be. Okay, Michael? Yeah, two, two comments on the heels of that. First, when we go back to Genesis 1, when God creates Adam, who is man and, and humanity, He creates him male and female. That alone reflects the image of God, neither entirely male nor entirely female, but as reflected in male and female. Then when the two come together in Genesis, the second chapter, not only is there the perfect complementarity and the ability to reproduce and everything else that goes into a relationship and then the ability to join children to a mother and father, but now that union uniquely reflects the image of God. So it's so important that we convey that, that there, there is a biological design, there is an emotional complementary uh, design, but there's also a design in terms of the image of God being reflected. I was, I was flying overseas to Rome one time and the gentleman next to me was an out and proud gay flight attendant that was off duty but going to Rome to meet his partner. So as he was out and proud, I was out and proud. And we had a wonderful conversation for several hours. And there were there were two gay men who were in first class traveling with three boys that must have been adopted for a previous marriage. And, and he said, you know, it's wonderful to see that. Look at this. They must be a successful family. Those men are giving the best to those boys. I said, did it ever occur to you that they're depriving those kids of having a mother? He said, I never thought of that. Something that simple. But a lot of it does come back to ultimately, it's all about me. I'm totally sympathetic to to what it must feel like for someone to be same sex attracted or for a boy to cry himself to sleep, uh, wishing he could change or to think God must hate me. But I, I had dinner last night with a local gay activist and his partner. They came to protest at our church a few weeks ago and left saying, you're too nice to protest. And he called my radio program to apologize for the protest. So I said, let's have a meal together. And he said, look, here's what we're always told. We're basically told if you want God, you can't have your sexuality. And that drives us away from God. Isn't it better for us to have God and our sexuality? And I said, in order to be a true disciple of Jesus, you have to deny yourself and take up the cross. To the very core of your being, you have to say no to what you want if it's contrary to the will of God, even to the point of Jesus saying you have to hate yourself, renounce the power of every other hold on your life, and now say, God, I'm yours, whatever you want. For the rest of my life, I belong to you. That's where we start with discipleship, whereas the contemporary American mentality and often the contemporary American gospel is bypass the cross. It's all about me. Jesus died to enhance me and make me a bigger and better and more satisfied person. The, the issue with homosexuality and other sexual desires fits into the same paradigm. Well, that actually is how I wanted to follow up, because I think the important observation that you're making here is, is that there's a denial that goes on, and that denial doesn't apply just to homosexuals when it comes to sexuality. That's right. That denial comes in all kinds of areas related to sexuality for, for every person. And, and, and that discipline, if you will, in relationship to sexuality uh, is something that everyone faces in one form or another. So it's not unique 
to the homosexual. Isn't that right? That's absolutely right. And I, I want to – Michael uh, leapt off of my, some of my comments, and I want to leap off some of his comments because they, they were very astute. I think one of the failings of the evangelical church is that we so promote the nuclear family that it is oftentimes the case that people living in single chastity are feeling left out. And, and the, the message that the church seems to have with, to them is nothing nothing more, nothing less than just don't have sex. But, but we oftentimes don't work hard at the creation. Of, of salient communities of people, communities of love, communities of dedication. Uh, we don't foster those relationships and create communities where single people are welcomed into the into our homes and become part of part of our families. And uh, I think the the scriptural witness is that marital life is a blessed state, but so also is single life in the, in the in the uh, model of Jesus Himself, in the model of Paul, and in, in the model of many figures in the in the history of the church. And so our failure in focusing on the family is 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 the is one of not holding up chastity and working hard as a community to to actualize to make it up the kind of blessed state that Michael was talking about. It is it is as you give up a certain dimensions of your sexuality, you don't cease as a single person to being a sexual being. And the person who tries to be asexual, to be non-sexual, is really cutting off part of their personhood. And and instead, that doesn't mean you, you that you act on your sexual impulses, but it does mean that you're aware of them. You take them into account, you realize how they feed into your relationships, you realize your identity as a man, as a woman. And, uh, and I think the church can allow for different modes of expression. There are, there are men who are less traditionally masculine and, they're masculine, and there are women who are less traditionally feminine, but uh, those, those are gifts that can be offered into the church and, and add to the community and the, g- the variety of giftedness in the church. Michael, why don't you explain uh, a little bit of the background of your involvement with the homosexual community and the ministry that you have, because that, that's the context out of which you're speaking. You're speaking out of a lot of experience in wrestling with this issue and thinking about how the church uh, should, should minister, really, uh, in the, in, to this context. Yeah, my own involvement is, is very interesting. My PhD is from NYU in Near Eastern Languages and Literature, so it obviously doesn't intersect with these issues. Uh, all my years of teaching and preaching, when I talked about sexuality and purity, it was always from a heterosexual viewpoint. Those were the issues I, I was concerned with, the breakdown of the family, pornography, adultery, those kinds of things, but always in a heterosexual context. Uh, when we moved to Charlotte, in 2003, thinking it's kind of a Southern Bible city. Uh, We were shocked the following year to see a local gay pride event, which is often marked by extreme expressions, which is often marked by sexual expressions and celebration of lewdness and vulgarity, which doesn't reflect the whole community, but it does send the message out. We were shocked in a public park with children. How can this go on? And then I began to see activism, the big businesses, some of the biggest companies in America based in Charlotte, the big banks, actively supporting gay activism, curricula in the schools, hearing more and more kids upset with what was being taught. And I became very burdened because of activism. And there's a confrontational part of me that that is going to expose what's wrong and stand up for what's right. But I understand that in order to do that correctly, we need to understand the other side, get in people's shoes. So as I began to read the literature, the firsthand literature of people who said, I tried to come out of homosexuality and I couldn't. I had demons driven out of me. I had shock therapy and I couldn't change. My heart began to break for these people. As, as I began to, to see what they were struggling with and how in their view this was really about civil rights and equality and liberation, I really began to identify with their struggle and understand it. And the, the model that we based everything on now for these eight years is reach out and resist. Reach out to the people with compassion, resist the agenda with courage. There is, there is an activist agenda that's confronting us on every level in almost every state school systems, colleges are being hit with it, flooding through the media, it's unavoidable, and we need to stand for righteousness in a responsible and godly way. At the same time, these are human beings for whom Jesus died, he shed the same blood for heterosexual as he did for homosexual, and it's, it's imperative for the church to change much of its paradigm that makes gay men and women into the worst of sinners, that drives them away rather than saying, hey, Jesus receives us as we are, and then he transforms us as we come to him. And because of that, we've, we've tried to have this balance. I'll often write articles about the activism. I have a 700-page book 
called The Queer Thing Happened to America. At the same time, I'm constantly trying to build individual bridges. And last year at the Gay Pride event, we had four or 500 of our people wearing red shirts that said, God has a better way. And we walked through the, the event, handing out bottles of water, just walking through, making people understand we're not thrilled with the protest in our city, but we care about you as individuals. And as hokey as it may seem, the bottles of water remarked, Jesus loves you. I was told by this gay activist I met with last night that they talk about that a year later as the model Christian protest, that they mm -hmm. said it was peaceful and it set a great example as to how we have our differences in the midst of a community. So that delicate balance, reach out and resist and to constantly try to build bridges. We had a forum at our church, Can You Be Gay and Christian? I invited local gay clergy and gay affirming clergy to come. I've done lecture series in which we say there'll be no gay bashing, but I want other points of view. We keep trying to reach out and establish dialogue as a bridge to share the gospel, and at the very least, to be better neighbors and citizens in the midst of our differences. Yeah, we really do have a tough tension here in some ways between uh, standing up uh, morally for what we think uh, God calls people to be, what the scriptures reveal about that. Uh, I think the church has sounded that note out pretty hard and pretty directly. Uh, and then we have this this idea that Jesus loves everybody and he reaches out to everybody and he is seeking uh, seeking to draw uh, people from everybody, if I can say it that way. And then the third thing that often is not in the mix is is our communities are, are, are tasked with, with modeling how to do this balance, mm -hmm. uh, how, to, how to frame communities that are able to, to juggle these balls all together at one time and do so in a, in a reflective kind of way. And I, and I think, in all honesty, we've, we've struggled with how to, how to do that balance, how to do that balance well, how to stand up for what you believe uh, – God has designed people to be. I mean, this is not just about what the Bible says. This is about what God has designed people to be and how people function well as human beings uh, alongside the idea of, of how do you have this outreach while you're, you're saying that the direction that you are going uh, is is not the healthiest direction right. for you to go. Stand. It's all about. I think that's absolutely on target, and it's all about, in a sense, what what is the path to human flourishing? And as Michael gave, I think, ample testimony, uh, the path to human flourishing is through death to self and life in Christ, to become one with Christ, and to become part of a, the body, the church. And the way that I've framed it for many years is that we have two dual responsibilities that are very hard to to hold in tension and to do both well, and that is to love. And to tell the truth, and uh, many, I think, uh, among many Christian young people today, there's such an emphasis on love that uh, the, the telling the truth gets gets uh, pushed out. And and what I think is built in implicitly in this is the idea that love means giving the other person whatever it is that they say they want. Mm -hmm. But I think when you look at the ministry of Christ, he he had a, a ministry that was loving and accepting and caring, but one that that always told the truth. I think of the woman caught in adultery and how that's story is retold oftentimes in gay activist circles, and it's told only in terms of, well, Jesus didn't condemn her. But the last part the of the segment is, is pretty important. the last line is very important, <laughs> yeah. go and sin no more. Right. Jesus doesn't blanch, and, and he doesn't shy away from the fact that what you've been doing is destructive and immoral and is not leading you in a path towards God. And, uh, and so I think the fundamental point is that love in the Christian understanding is not formless and void. Love takes distinct shape. It, God has a, a desire for how we are to live our lives. And that's where telling the truth uh, becomes so important. Some churches are all about telling the truth, and they don't embody the love dimension. And so they'll throw Bible passages at, at the gay people in their community, and, and uh, they'll issue moral judgments, but they don't live the kind of, uh, of life that Michael was talking about, about handing out the bottles of water and, and, and having dinner with people and treating them as real human beings, being willing to walk alongside them in patience. It's a very delicate balance to work that out in relationships. How do you maintain the moral standards but stay in relationship? And it actually becomes very hard as you're, as you're dealing with real human beings and, and staying engaged with them over a long period of time. But it, that is what God would call us to, I think, to be those that kind of have that kind of constancy of witness and that kind of thoughtfulness of how these two obligations to love and to tell the truth balance out. Well, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, Stan, by talking about your own expertise, and that is um, you're a professor of psychology 
psychology and you've worked and written in this area. And what do you regard as some of the more important studies that have been done that that uh, that reflect the research and what's going on uh, with homosexuality and what what can we say about it? I might say a quick word about how I got involved in this at all, Daryl. Okay. I, I, uh, I, it was just almost an accident in my graduate training that I got some training in human sexuality. And so I sort of, when I arrived at Wheaton College, I kind of drew the short straw as the only person who had any graduate training in it to, oh. to teach, teach a course for our master's program in sexuality. And as I got and get more and more engaged with the primary literature, you oftentimes really learn something when you teach it. And uh, I got engaged in that primary literature, and I began to see this ideological slant that was growing even then in the 1970s to use scientific research for uh, for ideological purposes. And the the first per- place I saw it was in the commendations of cohabitation and and the uh, the sort of strident stances that people would take that had no grounding in the actual research literature that cohabitation was good for people. Mm-hmm. And I looked into that and found that essentially every study that's ever been done on cohabitation shows that cohabitation is worse for people, that you have higher breakup rates and higher abuse rates and higher sexual infidelity rates mm. and, and on and on and on. And then I got interested in the way that in the same way same-sex uh, relationships and bisexuality were being pushed. And, uh, and what I found coming at the church was several really crucial arguments where science was being used as a bludgeon to move the church off its traditional moral teaching. So you ask, you know, what are some of the most important findings? I think um, uh, two, two major things come to mind. One is the argument that, um, that homosexuality is a natural biological condition and therefore it can't have any moral consequences. And the other is the argument that it's impossible to, for sexual orientation to change. And uh, just to pick uh, two, two studies uh, out, of, out of the many, um, in terms of uh, homosexuality being genetic, the best recent study published in 2010 was a study from the, the, uh, the twin registry, the identical twin registry for the nation of Sweden, hmm. and they found uh, 71 identical twin pairs. These are genetically identical twin pairs, usually raised together. They found 71 twin pairs where one of the identical twins was uh, – was was uh, fit the category of being gay, and what they actually found was that in only seven of the seventy-one pairs was the second identical twin gay. Now, this when you when you uh, uh, when you uh, equate sexual orientation with race and say this uh, sexual orientation is a civil rights issue because it's just like skin color, it's just like race. Well, one hundred percent of those identical twins ha- are the exact same race, mm-hmm. but only ten percent of the twin pairs were actually matched for their sexual orientation, and so so something's very very wrong with that with that analogy. We actually don't know what causes homosexuality, but there's a sense in which does it make any difference from the moral perspective? Many many critics of Christianity say something can only be moral if if you had the choice in framing it. But the fundamental Christian message about sin is we didn't ask for this. We're we're born in original sin. Mm-hmm. So so the idea that it has to be voluntary doesn't make any sense from the moral perspective that uh, that Christianity would hold up. Similarly, the issue about change, um, the argument is often made that that uh, change is impossible and therefore you can't have moral objections to homosexuality because God would not object to that which a person cannot change. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, it talks about, uh, you know, the following people will not inherit the kingdom of God and, and homosexual persons, homosexual actors are on that list and it says, such were some of you. Well. I think it's I think it's naive for Christians to assume that that those people were necessarily converted instantaneously from homosexuals to heterosexuals. Mm-hmm. To the opposite of sexual immorality is not heterosexuality. The opposite of sexual immorality is morality. It's chastity. It's it's purity. And so I think that what that passage teaches us is that that it is possible for people to be freed from a bondage to that this kind of sin. And this is one area where I've actually added a, an, an original scientific contribution. Uh, there were there was dozens of studies saying that homosexuality can sometimes change that were published between the 1940s and the 1970s. But as the as the uh, atmosphere of the mental health establishment changed during that time, there's actually been only three major studies that have been published in peer-reviewed journals since 1981. And uh, one of them was by a psychiatrist named uh, E. Manzel Patterson uh, that was published in 81. It's the second one was uh, Robert Spitzer's study in 2003. And the third one was the one that Mark Yarhouse and I just published in 2010 in the Journal of Sex and Marital Therapy. And we actually did what, n- what no other researchers have done before, and that is we followed a group of people longitudinally over time 
time, over a six-year period. Hmm. And uh, we found that some people uh, went back to the gay lifestyle after trying to change through the uh, group Exodus. But we also found that some people uh, achieved and maintained stable chastity in singleness, and they reported that this was satisfying, that they considered this to be a success, that they did not identify their their primary uh, sort of status in life as being gay, but the, rather they identified their primary status in life as being Christian. And But there was also a group of people who had moved from being primary, primarily homosexual to being able to function heterosexually. And so that does appear to be possible for some. I don't have any reason to think that that's possible for everybody. Mm-hmm. And I don't think the Christian faith requires that. The Christian faith requires purity, not not conversion to heterosexuality. In, in answering your question, Michael, do you have anything you want to add as you listen to this? Yeah, f- first, of course, uh, great thanks, Stan, to you and Mark for the studies you've done for the book and for the article. I've often pointed to it and said, here, you've got a longitudinal study documenting things. My own uh, late brother-in-law came out of homosexuality, but it wasn't even an intent. And then over a period of years, noticed he was attracted to women and ended up marrying my sister-in-law, and, and the two of them lived a normal life thereafter until he passed away. The, uh, the, the fact is that there's so much pressure in the scientific academic realm to come against the idea that change is possible. The classic example of uh, Professor Robert Spitzer, Columbia University, a pioneer that helped to depathologize homosexuality in the APA in 1973. Some years later, does a study wondering, is it possible people can change? He interviews them, does standard interviews. He's written several hundred peer-reviewed scholarly articles. He knows how to do his research. And he, he listened to what the people said and believed that, as others do on the other side and wrote his study saying, yes, some people who are strongly motivated can change. He got blasted, vilified for it. He's now, what, about 80 years old with Parkinson's. Well, he recently wanted to retract the study. And the journal editor said, you can't retract it. There's no error in the study. We don't retract it. Well, he's now renouncing it, basically saying, look, I made the error of believing what the people said. Look, he's an older man. He, he's been a pioneer for the underdog. In his view, his study was being misused by the religious right and so on. But he got vilified the day the study came out, vilified. He was a man that was a pioneer for, for gay activism. We see it now with the Regnerist study uh, about kids who are, who are raised by parents who are involved in same-sex relationships, not having as good an outcome on average as those who are raised uh, by, by heterosexual parents. He's been blasted, it calls to investigate him, and, and uh, why the outcry? Well, I, I have a chapter in my book, A Queer Thing Happened to America, listing what major researchers and, and, and psychiatrists and psychologists say about the suppression of evidence from the other side. When people say, how come we don't hear more about this, people often risk their professional careers. If Stan wasn't at a friendly place like Wheaton to, to put out a study like this, could have cost him his, his career or, or any respect that would come with it. And even on the twin study, and, and these have been done in quite a few nations now, some with, with large uh, databases, uh, very large databases where they've, they've looked at things with twins, there's a nasty little secret that even among those that come out, two identical twins that were raised in the same household that are both gay, often there's a relationship that evolved between them. There's often incest involved, and that can further shape the outcome. But the bottom line is it's, it's not genetic. And absolutely, our firm would stand said, even if it was, here's the simple soundbite answer for your Christian on the street. Maybe you were born that way. I don't think so. But even if you were, Jesus said you must be born again. <laughs> it's a simple <laughs> truth. It's that basic. Well, there, there, now there was something going on uh, with this uh, discussion that I think is important. Uh, Stan, you used the phrase early on in your reply about the research where you used the phrase homosexual actor. And I think that that phrase is an important phrase to kind of get our our hands around in terms of what is meant. There is uh, there is the issue of identity that it's wrapped up in in this question and how it's often posed. But then there's also the issue of uh, of acting out or following through on either that perception of, the, of what one's identity is or how one thinks about identity in relationship to this question. I think this is a huge 
area of, of conversation, particularly when you begin to interact with someone who is homosexual and who says, I am a homosexual. They're using that as their identity. This is who, who they think about themselves in terms of who they are. What what help or advice would you give to us in, in interacting with someone whose identity is wrapped up in their in their sexual in their sexual orientation? You know, I think from a scriptural perspective, it's important to point out that most of the passages that that condemn homosexual uh, immorality are focused on behavior. They say, you know, don't do the, don't do this thing. But it's not the case that scripture doesn't care about our the inclinations of our heart or the direction of our desires. I think that the the major message of Romans one is not that uh, not that God sort of deliberately gives these destru- destructive impulses to someone, but rather that these are symptoms of our human brokenness, symptoms of our human rebelliousness. And that you know, Christ Himself says, "Out of the heart pour these these immoral things." And so, our our desires are not morally indifferent, but they but God does give us control of our actions. And and uh, the you and I were talking before we started taping that um, that there's this issue of, of uh, the today that identity is viewed as something that you simply receive. It's something that you sort of uh, peel the onion, find out what's underneath, and suddenly you know what you are, and mm-hmm. what you find there is what you embrace. That you, you you peel the onion and you embrace that's what's at the core. But I think the fundamental Christian message is really something f- quite different from that. It is that God holds before us the person that we ought to be. He is willing to redeem us from what we are and put us on a journey that we will never complete in this life, but rather that we will move towards ever closer the image of what He wants us to be, and that will be cl- completed in in eternity. And as we deal with the secular community, we are dealing with a situation where um, the idea of identity has become the fundamental given. And so uh, it, we do have to separate behavior and attractions and identity, and they're really not the same. They emerge very differently in the surveys. You can even, even in the surveys in the secular scientific world, people respond very differently if you ask, have you acted on your sexual, on, uh, have you acted homosexually? Have you, do you have homosexual or same sex desires? And do you, do you embrace? same-sex identity, and, and uh, there's seven, eight, nine, ten percent of the population experiences some form of same-sex desires, and yet a smaller percentage, probably three to four percent, ever engage in, uh, in same-sex behavior, and then in terms of embracing the identity, it's, it's smaller yet. But the gay activist community, as Michael is saying, wants to treat that that sexual identity is a is an a sort of an un, uh, un, undissolvable entity. It's something that you, if a person says this is my identity, that can't be questioned. But I think uh, again, or going back to Michael's earlier definition of the gospel, where we're called into dying to self and becoming alive in Christ. Uh, to become alive in Christ is to say, I want to lay how I even construe myself before uh, before God, and I want to have a uh, 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 the kind of relationship with God where He is calling the shots, where <laughs> where uh, where He is shaping my identity, and I don't I don't define myself; God defines me. And so the key idea here is that the core identity becomes uh, the, the the sense of being a Christian and wanting to live out the way God has intended for human life to be lived and the way he's designed it uh, in contrast to simply following through on whatever desires I might have. That's right. And uh, I, th- I think this is an area, again, where the evangelical church can can fail us sometimes because with our emphasis on defending the family, we present that the only form of fullness that God wants for you is the, the nuclear family. So you need to experience that conversion and uh, and quickly make it, uh, make it over to the heterosexual side and so forth and so on. And that's a wonderful blessing when it happens, but it's not the only path. And so single people are ca- capable of growth in uh, in Christ-likeness, and, uh, and so that, that is a great gift. And the difficulties we inc- that we experience along the road are, are part of the challenge, part of the shaping process. Those difficulties can be used by God just as powerfully as the, the, the things that are seemingly uh, blessed. Um, Michael mentioned uh, Robert Spitzer being diagnosed with Parkinson's. It's odd. He was the last person to publish a major study. I was more recently published it, and I have Parkinson's disease, <laughs> and so I'm, you know, what I'm experiencing is in some increasing complexity of my life, some difficulty in my life. But it's amazing the way that God uses these difficulties to shape and mold us, and and that we can experience in brokenness a, a closeness with Christ that is is uh, is part of what it means to be shaped in His image. And so uh, when we when we think about you know sometimes when we get in 
this discussion. It's like homosexuality is kind of in this special category, and they're different than everybody else, and it's us and them and those kinds of things. But really what I'm hearing you say is we all struggle in the area of sexuality. It may not be in this particular area, but we all have issues where where we're called upon to respond differently than the way um, maybe desires that seem to pop up innately within us uh, surface. That's right. And that, and that this is part of this is part of, of the walk of the commitment of being uh, committed to where it is God is taking uh, and trying to take all of us. And, and so for some it may involve homosexuality, for others it may involve issues related to lust. For the, for single people it's disciplining their sexuality until they come into marriage. Yeah. I mean, there this works in a variety of realms, realms in a variety of ways and touches everybody. No one is excluded from the kind of, I'm going to use the word, orientation to God that is designed to trump or transcend uh, other orientations we may have. That's right. You know, a great example, Daryl, is, is I'll, I'll never forget my conversation with the first person I ever met who had experienced significant transformation from the from living the homosexual lifestyle into one of the more dramatic sort of healings and reorientations I've ever seen, and I'll call this guy Fred. But at the time I met him, he'd been married for 13 years, had five children, and was a loving father and, mm-hmm. and doing great. But he had been deeply immersed in the gay community from age 14 for 13 years until he was 27. When when, when he uh, heard the gospel, responded in a radical and distinct way, God called him into marriage. And I'll, I'll still remember the part of the conversation where I said to him, so Fred, so you have but you have switched from being a homosexual to being a normal heterosexual. He said, absolutely not. And I was rather, I was rather shocked by his response. I said, what do you mean you're not a normal heterosexual? He said, to be a normal heterosexual male is to experience sort of promiscuous impulses that are sort of the bane of your existence. It's to experience lust and be drawn in many directions. He said, God has given me a great gift. He said, I still struggle with homosexual impulses, but God has given me sexual desire for my wife alone among among women. And he said, I'd much rather have I'd much rather carry this gift <laughs> hmm. than uh, than to struggle with the way that many heterosexuals struggle. And so, yeah, so so all of our sexual desires are broken. Our sexuality is broken. Our sexuality is, is tied into our desire for for human connection, for bonding, and uh, and so there's all kinds of of disabilities, if you will, that are built into that. We're all on this journey of learning how to love more, how to give more. For those of us who are married, we're learning what it means to be united in one flesh. We're le- learning what it takes to to die to self and offer up in submissiveness to the other, the gift of the the gift of the self to the other. And that's a that's a great challenge, but it's really really a, 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 a something that requires a lot of difficulty and challenge along the way. Michael, we're talking about, of course, how orientation yes. relates and how Christian orientation, if I can use that phrase since orientation is a big word, uh, can transcend uh, uh, other types of orientation or identities that we may possess or feel that we have. Um, what have you uh, seen in, in on this question? Yeah, uh, sorry I dropped out there for a moment, not sure what happened. I heard a former lesbian say this, and it ties in with Stan's comments about the opposite of of immorality is morality. She said, God never said, be thou heterosexual, because I, the Lord thy God, am heterosexual, but be thou holy, because I, the Lord thy God, am holy. So we understand, again, that that is the goal, that's what we're all striving after, which is why when we recognize the behavior issues, I always tell pastors and leaders, don't say homosexuality is a sin say homosexual practice is a sin, lest you condemn the person for having desires or thoughts or impulses. Uh, also, the, today's society, and especially the gay community, wants a Jesus who practices what I call affirmational inclusion. He accepts me as I am and affirms me for who I am. I say that Jesus practices transformational inclusion. He receives us as we are and transforms us into his image. What, what we will hear from the homosexual community, and it's something we need to be challenged by, is this. Look, it's one thing for you to be chaste as a single person because you know there's the potential for marriage. But here, I'm 18 years old. I'm gay. It's who I've always been. I'm going to come to Jesus in your church, and that means I'm going to have to be alone until I die at the age of 88. That's your gospel. What we have to say again is first... I yield my entire life to Jesus without condition. Whatever he wants, whatever he desires, by life or by death, that's a normal New Testament commitment. And if he calls me to be single or if he gives me the gift to be married, 
I'm his disciple anyway. But the church needs to really recognize the struggle and get alongside of people, especially some who've come out of a very promiscuous lifestyle and will have more falls than they'll have success for a little while. That's where the body just has to say, hey, we love you. We're with you. We're not ostracizing you and we're not looking at you any differently. But, but I've asked this and I've never once gotten an answer in dialogue and interaction with gay activists. I am absolutely not comparing your average gay man or woman to a pedophile. I'm not making the association. I'm not putting them in the same group. But the, the research on pedophilia would also say no one chooses it. I mean, who in their right mind would choose something like that? The research would often indicate it's, it's the same as left-handedness. The, the very same arguments that are used to, to sanction homosexual practice are often used to sanction pedophilia. What do we tell someone who has those horrific perverse desires? There's no outlet for them. We're sorry. We know you're struggling, but this is absolutely contrary to everything that is best for you and for God and for society and for other children. There are certain things here. Here's a man who's married and his wife has a serious injury or handicap and they cannot have sexual relations for the rest of their marriage. What do we say? We ultimately say Jesus is enough. And if we'll give ourselves to him with the help of a loving community, he can make up for that lack. And then last thing I've asked gay men and women, can I embrace you as a fellow human being and love you and care for you as a neighbor and citizen without endorsing or celebrating your sexuality? They've often told me, no, I'm a homophobe, I'm hateful, and we have to push through that. There's no hate in that. There's actually love behind that. But the thing has been so enmeshed in our society, it's up to us as God's people to put this in proper order. And our communication is so important. Yeah, I think the tone of this discussion is is really important, and it's one of the things that uh, really is something that I think uh, we have to reflect on as a community, because I think that the tone with which we balance uh, the offer of the gospel and hope that Jesus brings that's able to uh, reshape uh, who we are mm-hmm. and how we respond in relationship to a person's sense of, this is who I am, and there's just no hope. Um, how, how to communicate that in a context in which oftentimes this topic generates a lot of heat and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of conflict and a lot of anger, uh, uh, high blood pressure. You can describe it in a variety of ways. Um, uh, how, how do we how do we as a church community overcome that tendency, the tendency to react in a way in which because you're standing up for right and you deeply believe in it, you know, you have this passion of wanting to communicate that, uh, how, how, do we, how do we help the church with its tone in this topic? Why don't you start, Michael? Surely. Uh, I, th- I think it's important to recognize that we will be misunderstood as Jesus was. Yes. That when we stand for righteousness, as Jesus said in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, beginning in verse 10, that, that we will be reviled and even persecuted. So we accept that. We understand that. If the world called him Beelzebub, what's it going to call us? So we're not expecting everyone to like us. But I think it's so important, as we do with any other issue, that we start with a confession of our own sin. I spoke at a rally recently, and the only word I said about homosexuality was this that no-fault heterosexual divorce in the church has done more to destroy marriage than all gay activists combined. We must point the finger at ourselves and, and recognize our own failures in a public way. So even though there's some of the gay community that, that hates and reviles me and, and looks at me as uh, articles have been written on me as that I'm an anti-gay monster, I understand there, there's going to be that perception. But I have on a number of occasions in Charlotte and elsewhere publicly apologized to the gay and lesbian community for the hypocritical example of the heterosexual church, for all of our scandals, for the guilt that's on our hand in terms of promoting immorality, tolerating immorality, destroying the family unit. Confess that first, and then secondly, confess our sins against the homosexual community and painting them as, as the worst of all sinners and every one of them some promiscuous deviant who's out to capture little children and things like that, and the worst enemy in fighting things in political terms rather than in compassionate terms. So I've offered that apology publicly, and then we've got to build relationships. When I had that long flight with the the fellow going to Rome, at the end of the flight, I said, if you met someone like me 
that held to all the views I hold to, would you consider that person a homophobe? He goes, oh, absolutely. I said, do you consider me a homophobe? He goes, no, I heard your heart. It's so wonderful to hear a conservative with a heart. Sometimes, especially when we're in a public setting before the secular media or some Christian radio show, we think we got to talk about those homosexuals and those sodomites and and we got to show how radical and righteous we are. And of course, it does no good. It doesn't further our message by taking on some type of tone. So at the risk of someone thinking that I'm soft on this issue, I'm going to speak with compassion, and I'm constantly going to try to speak in such a way that if a gay person was listening, they'd say, he understands me. Hmm. He understands my back. He, under- he sees the world through my eyes, even though he differs with me. And it's going to require patience, and ultimately, we must get in their shoes. I have read books written about struggles that gay men and women have had, or how they left the church or turned away from God because of preaching about homosexuality and put the book down and got alone on my knees and wept in the presence of God and said, I hurt for these people so much. I hate to be perceived as an enemy. Help help me to do what's right, but to do it in a way that glorifies you and helps them. And, And there's that tension we always have to carry as we stand for what's right and demonstrate mercy and compassion at the same time. I would just add that there's, that Michael has, I think, depicted it extraordinarily well. And the church is in a very difficult position because uh, as as different from sort of other situations, in this situation you had the added element of activism that wants to push the church into a certain mold. There was actually a book written almost 30 years ago, After the Ball, by Kirk and Madsen that, outla- that outlined a strategy for changing the attitudes of America. Uh, it was written by two gay activists, and one of the things they one of the things they really emphasized was that the gay community should always portray itself as victims and portray conservatives as the victimizers. And there's mm-hmm. a sense in which there's a drive to push us into that mold. And sadly, as Michael has intimated, all too frequently we we don't just fall in; we jump in. We mm-hmm. we we engage in this outrageous rhetoric and. Uh, Really, it really, it is. It can at times be, headic, be rhetoric that is truly hateful, and I think there needs to be, um, you know, training and and thoughtfulness in our engagement with these issues in such a way that we discipline ourselves that that we're going to follow Christ, not follow the mold that that we're, others want to push us into. So we're going to have the self control. We're going to have the discipline to stick stick to what Christ would have us say. To stick to the kind of perspectives that He would bring to this situation, and He would bring love and unrelenting pursuit. Our God is a God of patience. Our God is a, a God of faithfulness, but our God is also a God of purity. And so we we are people who have been given the gift of being being given a message. We, we've been given a message in the person of Jesus Christ. We've been given a message in His Word, and His Word guides us towards holiness. And so we don't have any option other than to love and to tell the truth. And so in doing so, um, we need to resist the activism that would push us off off center. Um, you know, I, I work at Wheaton College, and we we've, we've been the target a number of times of sort of gay activist groups, and uh, they oftentimes are very explicitly following a pattern of pro- intentional provocation. And mm-hmm. n- understanding that and not letting yourself be provoked, but rather responding with grace and love and truth um, is, is a discipline, and, and it really does pay off. Well, uh, I think this is uh, a, sig- a significant conversation, and uh, we're slowly running out of time, which is unfortunate, but I appreciate your uh, willingness to engage on this. Let me ask uh, one final question, kind of open-ended, and that is, if there's one thing you would say to people who who wrestle with this area, and I'm going to put two, I'm going to put two different kinds of people in front of you. I'm people in the church. What do you say to people in the church about this issue? And then, what would you say to uh, a homosexual person who is thinking about and is open to what goes on in the church? What do you say to each of those audiences about this kind of topic and engaging on it? For me, Daryl, to, to the person in the church, I would say. Approach the, per, the the homosexual person through the grid of a full confrontation with your own brokenness. Realize that you are a person on a journey. You are a person who's been called to die to self and to turn to Christ for redemption. And see in them the mirror of your own experience. Um, always approach them realizing that we are fellow human beings. They are, they are not the other. They are not the activist. They are another human being. And to the person who um, who is who's open, who's in the in the gay community, 
I think the, the major thing is to not start with the moral commands. That, that, that's almost a way of guaranteed to push them away. But rather try your best to introduce them to Christ, the, the, the living God, the Son of the living God, and, um, and bring them into a loving relationship with Him. The, the moral issues will come. Christ would call them to holiness, but those, he, the, the call to holiness only really grabs a hold of us when we see the need, the deep need in our lives. And so it is the living encounter with Christ that is going to be transformed. So in talking and having them come to Christ, you're talking about emphasizing those things that Christ offers people that that, that surround the entirety of life and not just this particular that's area. Right, that's right. And so you don't avoid sexuality, but sexuality is not the only area. Okay. Michael, what would you say? Yeah, so to answer in, in reverse order and to give us kind of a chaotic structure. <laughs> okay. The answer there, uh, it, of course – the issue of homosexuality may come up as I'm dealing with someone in the world, but I'm not going to start there. Uh, it seemed that many that I've met that say that they're even gay and Christian, it's more of a social Christianity. There's not really authority of scripture involved. So it's, it's nominal. Whoever the person is, I would make the entire focus coming into right relationship with God, the general guilt that's in their life uh, that we've sinned against God. I would really pray for the conviction of the Holy Spirit and I would point everything exactly as Stan said to Jesus and following him. Obviously the question of sexuality comes up. And while I would tell him there's the hope of change, I have to tell him you give everything to the Lord. We'll sort that out after, but right now, you're gonna have to give everything to Jesus and say, you're gonna be the Lord of my life. Forgiveness is free, salvation is a free gift, but it's one that requires embracing Jesus as Lord. But we make the mistake of starting on the sexual issue, and sometimes it's hard to avoid, but we need to do our best to push away from that. When I talked to these two gentlemen last night, I said, my goal in our interaction, my ultimate goal is to introduce you to Jesus in such a way that everything in your life will change. To someone within the church, not only would I put the emphasis on, on holiness and offer them hope for the future in God, I would try to give them a larger context because, because they're every kind of sexual expression goes these days. And now reality TV has shows on polyamory, polyamory multiple loving relationships. And now there, there are lawsuits and polygamous reality TV stars to say, why can't this be legal in our state? Everything kind of goes. Uh, the boundaries have been removed. I would help that person to see, look, a lot of what's happening now goes back to the sexual revolution of the 60s. This is part of a larger degeneration in our society. And I would show them when you open the door here, look at what's happening. I would want them to understand that this, this sexual promiscuity of which celebration of homosexuality is, is part of that, even among committed homosexual couples, the fact is it's part of a larger social moral issue. I want them to see that the same struggles they're having are ultimately going to impact little kids in the school, like at the nursery school here in Charlotte, where teachers are not allowed to call the kids boys and girls because that would be making a gender distinction. Mm -hmm. And I would try to point them back to there's something special about what God intended for male and female. And, and you are not what your desires are. You are who you are in Jesus. And if, if you could take your mind off sexuality for a little while and just focus on being a child of God and who you are in Jesus and really developing intimacy with him and will help you grow as a disciple, a lot of things will dramatically change. And then, of course, we got to be willing to cry with them and, and walk things through with them. And, and if, if the whole goal is don't think about an elephant for the next hour, and I'll give you a thousand dollars. That's all we're thinking about. The whole half heterosexual, that's guaranteed to fail. So can can to I ask you to just repeat them. that? You broke up a little bit. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. If, if I say, uh, uh, don't think about elephants for the next hour and I'll give you $1,000, that's all we're going to think about is elephants. <laughs> if someone, whole emphasis is, I can't think of homosexual thought, I have to think heterosexual thoughts, you're, you're, you're guaranteed to fail. So just forget about that right now. If a thought comes, let it go in one ear, out the other. That's not who you are. You are not who you desire sexually. You are, you are not 
who you desire romantically. You're a child of God called to be holy, and we're going to help you grow in that. And it's amazing to see the changes and disciplines that come as we put first things first. So as our uh, uh, sense of identity shifts from our desires and what runs through our mind in relationship to desires and moves towards our relationship to God and how he can not only uh, come into our lives, you know, this is this is actually where the gospel speaks to this area. You know, the gospel is not just about having sins forgiven. The gospel is about an enablement that God gives that comes through the spirit and the life that mm-hmm. he, he gives to us when we come to to him, and that uh, opens up uh, new uh, vistas and new possibilities for who we are as people, capabilities that we didn't have uh, before we come to God and focus on Him. And so I think it's nice to come to the end of this and and to think about how the gospel actually can speak into this situation, that, that in our identity that we find in Christ and in the capability that He gives to us through the Spirit that comes from the Christ when we come to Him, uh, we we have the possibility of, of, of living differently than we did before. It may not remove everything that we've struggled with before because we struggle and grow to the end as we've talked about, but it does mean that there's the possibility of, of being different than who we were. And in that transformation, there's the possibility of hope of a different way of life. Is that, is, is that what we're saying? I think that's well said, uh, Daryl, and, and I, I think that there is hope for transformation, there's hope for redemption, there's hope of being made whole, and uh, that is the, the business that God is about. Michael? Yes, absolutely. And Daryl, you're the Greek scholar here, but most Christians just think of grace as unmerited favor, which is wonderful and extraordinary, but it doesn't end there. It, it's God's ongoing gracious help, it's God's empowerment. I got saved as a heroin shooting, LSD using, rock drumming, 16 year old lost kid, full of pride, hatred, anger. And to the core of my being, Jesus changed who I was and said, deny yourself, take up the cross. But when you see Jesus, it's not morbid. It's it's not terrible. It's not like a monk, you know, wearing, you know, flagellating himself or something like that. It's glorious, it's wonderful. If we can really present Jesus, and connect people to the living vine, there's no better life. Yeah, I, I think the power that we're talking about here to transform and to change, uh, it changes all of us in a wide variety of areas, and that's why we're that, that's why we're discussing homosexuality in the context of sexuality and humanness as a whole, because I do that's think right. the real danger here is that in focusing just on homosexuality, we lose a context for, for humanness and humanity and the way God made us, and, and we end up... It, it's your elephant example. You know, I end up being focused on the elephant uh, and trying to forget about the elephant, and I can't forget about the elephant when, in fact, what we're asking is, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a creature of God? What does it mean to be in fellowship with God? And then how does God engage us in that life in such a way that we become the people he designed us to be rather than the reflecting the brokenness that we tend to come into life with? Well, I want to – Thank you all for the time and for the discussion. Uh, I'm sure we may try and do this again, but I really do thank you for your coming to the table and talking with us about what is a very important uh, set of issues, and that is the whole area of sexuality, homosexuality, and, and the Christian and the Christian church. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.